Today we're going behind the scenes to meet some of these brain center people. We'll see their new programs and we'll hear about their dreams and we'll certainly feel their gratitude for what the brain campaign has done for them and for their patients. You might wonder why in a tour of a brain center that we come to an ambulance bay. And that's because we are standing behind a stroke ambulance, the only stroke ambulance in Canada, and it is a jewel in our brain center campaign, one of the mainstays of our campaign. So Dave is the CT technologist who runs the, the critical part of this ambulance, which is a CT scanner. So let's get this straight. There's a CT scanner in an ambulance, and you carry out CT scans side of the road or in safe zones and parking lots. That is hospitals. correct. And how do you get those images back to the we university hospital? We send them hospital? via the internet onto PAX at here, and the neurostroke doc sees them instantaneously. Can you bypass the emergency room? If, you're, if you made the diagnosis by CT, you've talked to a stroke fellow and a stroke neurologist, can you go right to the interventional unit? Yes, and we have actually yeah. recently. Mm -hmm. uh, we went directly up to the interventional unit um, from from our ambulance, um, which actually decreases workload on the ERs as well. So can you think of um, any particular stories that were really gratifying and that shows the value of this stroke ambulance? We did a call where we responded from the hospital here out to a 80-year-old female that was having a stroke while she was driving out Stony Plain Road. Another ambulance arrived. Uh, we showed up on scene. Uh, we were able to move the patient from the other ambulance into ours. The patient then was given, we had a CT done, TPA was given on scene. The patient was transported back to the hospital here, uh, went upstairs for endovascular therapy where they removed the clot. And I believe it was six days after that, the patient walked out the front door of the hospital and went home. I was told and, full recovery. And full recovery. Yeah. We're with Dr. Tom and Jericho Thill, who is a neurologist who specializes in the management and the research uh, surrounding stroke. What, what do you see as some of those future steps in the management of stroke and even in our, our neurology program? The University Hospital Foundation has been incredibly helpful in managing stroke and has really played a pivotal role. You, you can actually go through almost every area of the continuum of care and see where they've contributed. Uh, from prevention, uh, there's, a, there's a major uh, funding of the AHO and Stroke Prevention Clinic, which is a, a clinic that actually serves the entire north of the province. Uh, that's uh, received a, a University Hospital Foundation funds. The Stroke Ambulance itself is, is a shining example of a first in the world project that's enhanced care in Edmonton and the surrounding areas. It's also been funded by the University, University Hospital Foundation. The uh, Brain Center campaign, where we're actually you know, trying to plan for uh, a, a, an organized brain center to enhance the intensive care unit, observation beds, uh, and the inpatient stroke units uh, is also an initiative that the uh, University Hospital Foundation has backed as well. There, there's a great contribution. Tell us about the importance of a, a neuro ICU with a, a stroke unit. It's of critical importance because when we give clot busting drugs, uh, when we give catheter-based treatments for stroke, the patient needs to go somewhere uh, where there are very, very highly trained uh, people with specific stroke expertise. In other places in the hospital, you know, you've got, uh, you've got expertise, but it's not as stroke-focused, and it's important that it be very stroke-focused because these people have very specific complications and very specific monitoring requirements. Uh, and so I, I can't emphasize how important that is. And it actually will help us to get patients out of the emergency department faster. We're in the diagnostic imaging department now with Dr. Jeremy Rempel, who's a neurovascular interventional neuroradiologist. Can you tell us why an interventional suite has become such an integral and important part of a brain center? Just this is an, an example of a cerebral angiogram behind us, and you can see the complex uh, anatomy inside the brain. Uh, and something like this uh, is necessary for us to safely navigate the brain. But more than that, uh, why it's critical now is that we have so many minimally invasive techniques to treat brain disorders, anything from a ruptured aneurysm to stroke. Uh, and it's all being done with a machine just like this. And can you tell us why it's, it's important to be paired with, for instance, a stroke ambulance? The stroke ambulance is critical to getting uh, 
you know, a first-line treatment, so TPA or something, a lytic drug that can be given through an intravenous uh, as fast as possible to a patient. But in addition to that, they're speeding up the uh, time that the patient can get to this hospital. So unlike uh, IV TPA that you can put in a fridge and into an ambulance, um, this suite is only here. This is the only hospital in Northern Alberta that has not one but two of these. So it's critical to get the patients to this hospital as fast as possible. I'll bet you've seen some dramatic results. Uh, the one that sticks out in my mind the most uh, was actually when I was close to when I started working here. Unfortunately, the patient was breathing on their own, uh, but when we deployed the stent, it actually kind of squished the clot around to the outside of the stent uh, and temporarily blocking flow to the patient's brainstem. So unfortunately, within seconds, they stopped breathing mm -hmm. on the table. Uh, so we acted quickly, pulled that clot out, and immediately the patient took a deep breath uh, and basically started talking again. We're standing now in the Dan and Bunny Whitney intraoperative MRI suite, and it's really one of the jewels of our entire brain campaign. Really got us started on our brain campaign. Probably one of the most advanced operating rooms for neurosurgery anywhere in the world. Can you just tell us a little bit about this room and how it works? The room itself is actually not much different than a normal operating room. And in fact, the thing that makes it different, you can't see because it's hidden behind the wall. And that's the magnet that's sitting in there. And that's the thing that's made the difference. In a normal operating room, you would do the operation and you'd finish. You'd do it as best you can at the time. But now, after when you think you've done the best job you can, you can get an image with the MRI and see whether you've completed what you thought you'd, you'd undertaken. And so that's, that's the revolutionary part of it. And that's changed really the way we operate and who we operate on. If, if all we were doing was uh, taking the tumors out the way we always took them out and getting an image after, that would be an advancement. But that's only the tip of the iceberg for the way we, we, we uh, carry out the care now. So we can actually not only see what we can see with our naked eye, see what we can see with the microscope, but also see what we can't see, which is the fiber tracks that the, that the MRI will show us. And we can model those out and use mostly research MR techniques to try and see those in the operating room. We're just at that forefront of melding the research to the clinical mm -hmm. tools. Thank you. So this is state-of-the-art equipment down here, and why is it so important to, in a brain center to have this leading-edge, state-of-the-art imaging equipment? Well, scientists like myself and our group, uh, we develop new MRI techniques, and for that we need the latest MRI hardware and technology. It allows us to get better quality, higher resolution images with new contrasts, and lets us look into the brain in ways that we could never do before. And this way you kind of are one step ahead of the curve and you're leading us in terms of imaging and in terms of brain treatment. It happens down here sometimes before it even happens in the clinical side of the hospital. For sure, the technology development always precedes the clinical application. So what we do is we try to push the technology to its breaking point and then we work with clinicians like yourself to then see what that technology is useful for by applying it to patients with neurological and psychiatric disorders uh, here at the UVA hospital. We're trying to develop a state-of-the-art brain center. And what does the gamma knife mean? It's a, an exceptional contribution to that. This is a complete different side of neurosurgery. And it's even a bit of a different side of radiation oncology. Our ability here is to treat a patient in a single treatment most of the time. And for them to, to go home and by the time they wake up the next morning to feel like nothing happened. You know, there's no incisions. Um, or lengthy hospital stays. It's really done as an outpatient. The concept behind the Gamma Knife is radiation is being directed from 192 locations, all down onto one little pinpoint. And that can focus any point within the brain, um, even deep down towards what the particular nerves. And, and so the point where they all cross gets a very high dose, but everywhere around it is protected um, and only receives a, a mere fraction of that. One of the great things about this machine is someone can be diagnosed with a stage four cancer that is extended into their brain, and we can essentially get them in the following day and get them treated. And once they've been treated for the brain, they can move on to dealing with the, the disease burden in the rest of their body. 
And little by little over time, these tumors, they will actually shrink away and almost disappear. And by doing that, we protect them from a neurological standpoint, which is often one of our biggest concerns, and give them the opportunity to try to overcome the disease that they're challenged with. We're standing in the intraoperative MRI suite with a three Tesla MRI machine. Superb imaging. It's not the only one we have in our brain center. There are two others. Of course, imaging is the first step. You need a good picture of the brain to pick the target that you want to stimulate and where you want to place the wire. But in order to, to place that wire with great precision, we actually keep patients awake for several hours during surgery and we map the brain. It requires very sophisticated equipment to record from individual cells and neurons as you're moving along that trajectory to the target. And that equipment uh, is, is, uh, has all been supported by the, the University Hospital Foundation. Now with deep brain stimulation and very focused lesioning as I, as I was talking about earlier, we can really treat the, the worst of the worst patients, patients who are suffering from obsessive compulsive disorder and in some cases very severe depression. Uh, these patients are, are so severe that they are admitted to hospital several times over their lifetime. They can't leave the hospital. They're on multiple medications and they failed and their quality of life is very, very poor. In these patients, just as with movement disorders, we can find key parts of the brain and key circuits that we can modulate. The, the focus of our brain campaign has been on the neurosciences ICU to upgrade and, and develop a new neurosciences intensive care unit. Can you just tell us a little bit about how important that is to a brain center and an evolving state-of-the-art brain center? To run a state-of-the-art neurosciences unit, you need a state-of-the-art neuro ICU. And this is not a niche ICU. This is an ICU that already treats thousands of Albertans and Western Canadians every year and could treat even more. Time is brain. The longer time is delayed, potentially the worse the outcome. The quicker, the better. And as a result, not just saving lives, but saving quality of life occurs when you have imaging right in the ICU, where an unstable patient doesn't need to be moved far, where they can be imaged right away, where we can see the images right away, where we can talk to our surgical colleagues right away. There's a reason why we use the word stat in medicine. It really, truly makes a life-saving difference. And all along, this is a brain campaign, and we've been talking about the brain. But the central nervous system is not just the brain. There's a spinal cord and there's peripheral nerves. Tell us a little bit about how important that is to the neurosciences, the peripheral nervous system. Sure, Keith. Um, peripheral nerves are the essential connection between the body and, and, and the brain and spinal cord. So without nerves, you have no movement and no sensation and they're unique structures and they have a biology all of their own and a whole set of disorders, very common disorders. Diabetic polyneuropathy occurs in up to 50% of diabetics. Type 2 diabetes is increasing worldwide, so it's a huge problem. We also have a research lab supported by the Hospital Foundation and other agencies to see if we can get these nerves to, to grow back. How important is a, a research institute to a brain center? Uh, I think it's absolutely critical because I think all of us who've been in this field for a while recognize that we see a lot of patients who have neurological deficits and they're no better and we have nothing new to offer them to improve them. And so without research, we're not going to do any better than that. We're going to stay fixed in 2019. So I think the research component right from the molecules to how they react uh, to models of disorders are absolutely essential to know where to go. We're standing in front of the neuroscience clinic where you see your multiple sclerosis patients. And can you bring us up to date on, on what's happening in the MS clinic? We realized really in the early 2000s that it really takes a team of people to help care for people living with multiple sclerosis. And so that has really been the impetus and the drive towards bringing the appropriate people together in different ways in order to help these people cope with their lives and live optimally, you know, so that they can live, they can have their children, uh, contribute to their relationships, contribute to society and work. We have a number of our equipment that has been funded by through the University Hospital Foundation. We have uh, our second nurse practitioner who does the outpatient work is funded through the University Hospital Foundation, really trying to deliver care outside of the clinic successfully. And then we're building initiatives through the University Hospital Foundation around increasing our resources 
resources and rehabilitation, liaising with the CRIS program downstairs and with the Glen Rose uh, program, trying to create a hub and spokes model of care. Well, we're still in the Caden Clinic and we've made our way down to the Doreen Lutsky Hooper Rehabilitation Clinic. And this is very much part of the neuroscience program. It's a difficult diagnosis for people, but there is still a lot of hope with movement disorders. And can you tell us a little bit about your movement disorder clinic? Absolutely. So we currently have nine physicians working in the movement disorder clinic, as well as nurses, physiotherapy, occupational therapy, dietitians, speech language pathology, and you're right. Uh, physical and rehabilitation therapies are so important to our patients. We're involved with research locally at the Hope House at the University of Alberta to use hope-based therapies to help newly diagnosed patients build on their own resilience to face a chronic illness because that's what Parkinson's is. It's no different from having had a heart attack. You change your lifestyle, you take your medications, and you manage your symptoms. That's what we're doing with Parkinson's disease, and we just want to give our patients the tools to do that successfully. It all started really with the formation of a neurosciences department some seven or eight years ago. We brought the neurologists and the neurosurgeons and the neuro rehab specialists together. We formed new specialized neuroscience wards, intensive care units, operating rooms. With that organizational structure, we just started as a dream. Lines on paper. We had to equip and sometimes build those specialized units. We had to support the recruitment and the training of specialized staff. That's what really gave birth to the Brain Campaign. Our community and really our University Hospital Foundation got behind us. And what a successful endeavor it has been. In terms of brain, spine, peripheral nerve conditions, there's now virtually nothing we can't do here in Edmonton.